So today I'm with Professor Tarun Kana. Thank you so much for your time, Professor. Should I call you Professor Tarun or Professor Kana? Tarun. Tarun? Oh, yes. okay. Welcome to Dr. Sonia Wibisono YouTube channel. Jangan lupa klik subscribe, klik subscribe karena subscribe itu gratis. Klik like, klik like, klik share, share agar teman-teman bisa dengar juga manfaatnya. Klik lonceng, gambar lonceng, silakan komentar sebanyak-banyaknya. Profesor Tarun is an Indian born American academic author and economic strategist. He is currently the George Polo Lehman Professor at Harvard Business School where he is a member of the strategy group and the director of Harvard University South Asia Initiative since 2010. So what is your focus uh, today in the Harvard studies and also in the South Asia Initiative, Professor? Um, so uh, I wear two hats. First, I'm a professor at HBS. I've been here since 1993. And my consistent focus has been on understanding creativity and entrepreneurship in the fast-growing developing countries. So I've spent some time in Indonesia and Malaysia and Southeast Asia. Oh, you've been to Indonesia before? Many times, yes. Oh, really? Um, many times? Um, but my, I was born in Delhi, in New Delhi, yes. and uh, I'm Indian. And for the last 20 years, I've been doing a very detailed comparative study of entrepreneurship in China and in India. Yes. Um, particularly in outside of the main cities, and trying to understand how the structure of society is shaped by entrepreneurs. Mostly positively, I think, and sometimes negatively also. I'm trying to understand that and study it. My other role at Harvard is to oversee the entire university's um, effort in all the countries in South Asia, which are all the countries from Afghanistan to Burma. But of course, the primary activities in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, and that center is uh, one that reports to the provost of our university and represents all of Harvard, so not just the business school, the medical school, politics, arts and sciences, and we're interested in all aspects of scholarship, research, and teaching uh, that are relevant to South Asia. So what do you think about Indonesia since you have studied a lot about Indonesia and also compared to China and India because we are we are having like a large population mm -hmm. with uh, similar problems with India yes. maybe that uh, like 70 percent of our yeah. uh, people is like in the low low area. lower income yeah, yeah lower income. income areas yeah um, so I have done some research in Indonesia but it's been some time but I'm a frequent visitor so I, I and I have many 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 Indonesian friends so wow. that's that's the source of my 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 limited understanding of uh, uh, of Indonesia uh, and of course I've been to Bali many times so. wow. okay. <laughs> other than so Jakarta. what do you think about Jakarta uh, and Bali? Pollution? Pollution? Uh, <laughs> Jakarta is, uh, has many of the problems that uh, the uh, the developed world's big cities have um, you know, lack of urban planning um, insufficient investment in cure doctors, insufficient investment in public health, yes, yes. And very yes. poor investment in education, poor environmental controls. Um, so we have many of those problems in India, of course, um, and across Latin America and different countries in Africa. I just came back from Kenya and South Africa, and you can say the same thing about Kenya. So these are common problems to the emerging markets, and really what a lot of my scholarship tries to do is to ask, um, of course it's important what the government does, um, but I think it's also important for educated people who are fortunate, like yourself or myself or maybe your listeners, uh, who have had the benefit of a good education, some resources, have access to knowledge around the world, to begin to embrace the problems ourselves and not point fingers at the government all the time. Yes, yes. So I think we should be the, the change agents and involved and uh, that's what I teach about at Harvard and inspire my students to do. Um, everybody from 18-year-old Harvard undergrads all the way to 50, 60-year-old CEOs and politicians. Yes. Uh, and also with an online course, which is very exciting, was the online course now through Harvard X yes. um, on entrepreneurship and emerging economies, reaches tens of thousands of people every year and tries to build a movement to say, um, if you're lucky enough 
and you should play a role in changing things and inspiring the government to change instead of waiting for the government to change. Yes, yes, we cannot so, wait. We cannot yes. wait here for the government. So, so I think, you know, Jakarta to me seems not that different from many of the big Indian cities or, uh, uh, or the way Chinese cities used to be many years ago on the eastern seaboard. Um, China is probably not a great model for Jakarta. I mean, you have, a, you know, with uh, uh, Joko being re-elected and uh, we've had a re-election in India also. Um, but the, the democracy, the democratic aspects, the constraints and the possibilities that are made available to society through the process of democracy are very similar in, in Indonesia and India. And I think there may be more parallels between those countries that, than between Indonesia and, uh, and China, even though you have a big ethnic Chinese population in, uh, in Indonesia. So th there's a lot to learn. And a lot of what we do at Harvard and other, other good institutions is try to compare and contrast and work with our students and, um, uh, and, and well-wishers in the region to, to try to understand the you know, issues in those societies. What do you think about the Jokowi era, uh, the next Jokowi era, Indonesian economics? What I mean, I think it was, inter it was very exciting to see uh, Jokowi come to power. Um, uh, you know, he had a good track record, as I remember, as mayor and uh, seemed like a clean guy. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, you know, more disconcerting to see some of the, uh, the the social and religious tensions that keep on bubbling up in Indonesia, and we have the same thing in India also. So I understand, I understand the constraints and how people have to manage them, um, but anything that doesn't allow the Indonesian people to work together is a problem. Um, the same is true in India also. So I say the same thing in my country that I'm saying to your country that in India also if we have uh, divides of caste or uh, uh, or gender or religion, yes, we it's have a problem. Very diverse. Yeah, Indonesia. these are diverse societies, and uh, you know Indonesia is uh, much smaller than India physically, but it's still a very complicated geography with all those islands and <laughs> everything. And, uh, so all the religions, different religions, yes, yes. different. Languages, ethnicities, yes. um, and uh, yeah. And now, in the middle of all this, you want to move your capital cities. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's going to be quite something, though. Anyway. Yeah. So, what do you think Indonesian can learn from China and also from India to make yeah. a better economy? Well, I think what what we can all learn from China is that the biggest thing I think that we can learn from China is that um, two things I would say. One is significant investment in education pays off, mm -hmm. particularly primary education uh, and, and school education, uh, and over time uh, also tertiary education in universities. But primarily, if you look at uh, uh, even socialist China, before Deng Xiaoping uh, and his successors kind of opened up the country to, uh, to market forces and, and joined the WTO and so on and so forth, uh, before that, they had, uh, in fact, one of my colleagues at Berkeley jokes and says that China is capitalist today because it was socialist yesterday. And the socialism, uh, you know, made them emphasize universal education. And it's because they have a universally educated workforce that they can adopt many market-friendly practices. So when you think about your country and mine, India and Indonesia, uh, we have a lot of problems with education. And so it's very difficult to get uh, people who don't have the benefit of good education and exposure uh, to be competitive in the world economy. So I think one of the big lessons you've learned in China is invest as much as possible in education and do it consistently through thick and thin. Um, the second thing we can learn from China is be open to the world, um, that people come in and out. Uh, China, of course, has uh, its many problems. Uh, it's not completely free in many, in many ways, particularly when it comes to information and what you can say, some things are ruled out of, out of bounds. But by and large, it's been open to outside talent uh, and very welcoming of outside talent. And, uh, uh, you know, my own country, India, is much more open today than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but it's still not very open. Um, try getting a visa to India, it, you know, drives you crazy, just crazy. Um, simple things like that that we will not, uh, we, we, we're not able to address. And Indonesia has the same issue, is that it needs to actively be open to everybody and uh, not just allowing elites to fly to Singapore and back all the time, but really open to outside influences in different ways. So. Okay. 
how are the characters? What uh, what can we learn from China and India about building characters? Because you know Indonesians mm-hmm. are quite crucial for uh, for the characters. We have lots of demo and riots and people who can be paid for doing demos and riots. So I'm not sure I understand the question. Characters, you mean? Uh, the, what the characters from China and India that mm-hmm. can we learn to build the characters for our nation? What does it mean to be a character for a nation? Uh, the the character, I mean, like um, like a hardworking. Oh, oh character. Okay, I see, I see, I see. Cultural characteristics. Um. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, honestly, I don't think that when I when I think about all the people that I meet, whether it's in Wuhan or Jakarta or Bangalore, I don't think the characteristics are that different. Um, really? I think you. In all three countries, you have some very hardworking people, very intelligent people. You also have very lazy people, <laughs> and you have honest people, and you have corrupt oh, yeah, people. Yeah, okay. So there's a dispersion. I don't think that's any different. I think it's really the difference is where can we get some good policy lessons put in place so that we can unlock uh, the the intrinsic talent. Policy. Uh, uh, yeah, good policies, mm, uh, from either coming government. from the government or policies that 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 educated people, social entrepreneurs, activists should find a way to mobilize and suggest to the government so that the government adopts it. Because mm. who is the government? The government is just us, right? We are the government, so we have to be proactive in providing suggestions. Mm. Um, and, and holding the government accountable and using the media and making sure that the press stays free and all these kinds of things so that there's a democratic give and take and accountability. And anytime you see those being compromised in democracies, uh, whether it's the US or India or Indonesia or what have you, uh, it's a problem. So you think changing the capital city is not a good solution? Oh, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I mean, I just read in the press that uh, that your president had announced that it needed to happen at some point because Jakarta was sinking. So if it's sinking, I suppose it has to move. So <laughs> I'm not sure, uh, but it just seems like a big, uh, you know, moves of capital cities have not generally been successful um, in recent times. Um, so, but I'm sure your president's advisors will be, uh, be looking at all these moves and trying to make sense of them. So, so what do you think about your Indonesian friends? In this way, they are from business people? Uh, yes, they're very educated people. Um, some of them, um, sorry, they're, they're, they tend to be educated people. That they, some of them are my former students from Harvard over the last 20, 30 years who have uh, gone to Indonesia. And uh, some of them live in Jakarta and uh, mostly Jakarta. Um, some of them live in Jakarta and Singapore. Uh, you know that many yes. elites. Uh, live in Singapore and fly to Jakarta on Monday and work and go back. So there's that group. Uh, And then there's a group of um, very close friends who are of Chinese origin who left Jakarta uh, after Suharto, um, but are still very connected and play a very important and influential and constructive role. But they do it from uh, Singapore, Shanghai, London, places like that. So different people, but I don't have very many direct touch points with the common person on the street. Uh, I wish I did. I wish I had time to uh, to engage directly to learn because you learn the best from uh, walking around the streets. Yes, yes. But I have not had time. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you uh, written a book, winning in emerging markets. Mm-hmm. So what is the conclusion that we can learn? So winning in emerging markets is a book that I co-wrote with uh, my colleague and friend uh, Paleku who's also a HBS faculty member, almost a decade ago. Um, and uh, it's um, an attempt to uh, put some conceptual structure um, on what it means to operate in an emerging market. Why is it uh, different to be an emerging market than it is to work in Boston yes. uh, or London? Um, and also, what are the similarities between, say, uh, Mumbai and Jakarta? Uh, or uh, Jakarta and Qingdao. Um, how do we think about the similarities and the differences between different emerging markets, but also between emerging markets and developed mature markets? My way of thinking is that uh, entrepreneurship in uh, emerging markets has both higher risk 
uh, than entrepreneurship in Boston, but also higher borders, mm -hmm. because the needs are much greater. And so if you can figure out, it's harder to figure out a model that works yes. with all the constraints, less risk capital, less intellectual property protection, less availability of um, world, world talent, etc. cetera. Uh, but if you can figure it out, then the rewards, financial rewards and non-financial rewards are very large. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of um, you know, who has the appetite to engage in that process. Uh, so that's what the book really talks about. Um, that's that book. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's very inspiring. Yeah, we should read that <laughs> oh, about the book. Yeah, because there is a companion book that I wrote uh, last year called Trust. Uh, it's called Trust, Creating the Foundation for Entrepreneurship in Developing Countries, which really takes the lessons from being in an emerging market and applies it to my own personal stories uh, of both studying entrepreneurs uh, in India, China, uh, Latin America, Middle East, um, uh, and trying to ask, you know, what did I learn from these actual stories of building them? Uh, so that's uh, another another way into the same. Uh, so one of them is more of a book for um, MBA students and students in business schools, and the other is a book for everyday professionals okay. uh, to read. <laughs> so what inspires you the most about China? What inspires me the most about China? I, you know, I'm, I, I love to I love to travel and meet people. Um, I enjoy it. I love learning about the history and society of a place. In the economic session? Uh, in economic session? Uh, what inspires me about China? I think the connection between science and economic development is very inspiring in China today because China has realized what the rest of the developing world has not, uh, which is that no country can really grow very fast for long periods of time without really investing a lot in science. Mm -hmm. uh, even if there are countries like Indonesia or India or Philippines, many of the countries in that part of the world that are trying to catch up to the world frontier. Even the catch up process requires a lot of science, scientific literacy. You know, in your field, in medicine, it would be very difficult for somebody who's not trained in medicine to really understand how to take some of the latest discoveries around the world and apply them to the Indonesian context. But if you had educated doctors and paramedics and so on, they would be able to understand it. So you need the, the investment in science education. And China has realized in the last 10 years that they're putting billions of dollars into investing in this. And I'm trying to get the Indian government to do something very similar mm -hmm. because that payoff will, will happen over the next generation. Um, so that's the thing that I find most interesting about China today. Mm -hmm. So a government should pay for that, for education? And Usually education. something like a big push on science has to have a component of, uh, of uh, government backing and government resources because it's a really big public good and it's very and that's not going to come from individual entrepreneurs. Yes, yes. So that really is a public sector push, um, which is not easy to do in our countries because the public sector is not usually very well run. Yes, right? yes. It's very inefficient and sometimes corrupt and so on. Mm -hmm. So we have to solve that problem somehow. So what business that is really good for the uh, low low income people that is, has been done in India so far? Oh, there's so many. Um, there's so many great businesses. Uh, um, there's, you know, the whole fintech revolution, um, making it easy for people to save and to invest, to take micro loans, um, uh, and transition from being, you know, roadside entrepreneurs to small enterprises to medium enterprises. It's now possible in India and in Indonesia to get those loans uh, in a way that the formal banking system is not able to do historically. I have some Indonesian friends who are working on that in, uh, in, in Jakarta as we speak, uh, or even micro life insurance, for instance. Then you have a very big uh, agricultural economy. There's a lot of prospects for, I don't think Indonesia has done a very good job on, uh, on that front, but on just taking agro processing and uh, making it in a way that engages the small farmer. Admittedly, most countries have not done a good job of that. Uh, Indonesia is, and India are the same, in the same, in the same uh, boat. There are, I think there are lots of opportunities in decentralized health um, because our countries are never going to have the, uh, our, for the foreseeable future, will not have the physical infrastructure to provide care in very large, complicated hospitals. But now you can diagnose things on your phone, right, with, uh, with uh, mobile EKGs. You can diagnose, uh, you can certainly get your sugar levels uh, on your phone. You can get your HbA1c if you're a diabetic on the phone test your 
heart failure enzymes in your bone. I mean, there's so much of that stuff that you can do that we don't need to have millions of doctors running around, even, even trained paramedics uh, would do it. And I think a lot of business opportunities in that whole space yes, yes. that are working out. So, um, and I'm working on similar projects, uh, companies that I'm creating with my former students from uh, Harvard and MIT, uh, both in FinTech and and in decentralized medicine and uh, using artificial intelligence to allocate talent better. And there's a very long list of possibilities. It's a very exciting time. Wow. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. exciting time. Yeah, technology make everything different now, yeah? Make it, yeah, it opens up a lot of possibilities. So, uh, of course, it, you know, anytime you have a new technology, yes. it's potentially destabilizing. Um, and people worry about the instability. And we should worry about the instability, but we have to always consider the risk uh, together with the reward. If the reward is high enough, then it makes sense for society to somehow think about how can we bear the risk of this. Um, I think it's a mistake. It's a self-defeating mistake to say that um, it's risky, therefore we shouldn't do it, because then we'll all be stuck in the same place. <laughs> we have to learn to take the risks in some ways. I'm going to go and put them okay. on. So. Okay, thank you so thank much. You yeah. And one, one last question. Have you done the decent, uh, decentralized healthcare in mm -hmm. Indonesia for your fintech company? No, fintech and decentralized healthcare are two different things. Oh, okay. right? Decentralized healthcare, um, um, no, we have been um, distributing devices that we've created for detection of diabetes and testing oh, of diabetes. Okay. Um, in many Southeast Asian countries. Uh, we have an office in Singapore and Bangalore. It's a company called Jana Care, J-A-N-A-C-A-R-E. You can look it up on the web. Um, but I don't think we're in Indonesia yet. But we are primarily a science-based company and then we license out our technology. So if there's an Indonesian entrepreneur who wants to do something with it, they can license it from us and then build out uh, a decentralized uh, yeah, great, <laughs> venture. Great. So you can take a look at that website. <laughs> yes. Okay. But thank thank you. you so much, Professor, for Thank you for, for your time. Uh, thank spending you. time with me, thank and uh, good luck to all your listeners. Yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you so much for your time, and hopefully it will inspire us, and we'll, you, you will have to look at uh, Professor books and also <laughs> some of his projects in the internet. Thank you so much, Professor. Of course. Thank you for your time. Nice thank you so yeah. much.